materializing on a single uh, was a the mem semaphore uh, RW uh, was a mem mem memaphore or a memory semaphore for whenever you do page swapping, uh, the threads within a process will use this one uh, semaphore, which is a readable. So in mainline Linux, you have hundreds of readers. That's fine, but on the MAPSEM, thank you. I couldn't think of the name. MAPSEM. You have 100 readers doing this at the same time, it's fine. But on RT, every time it does a page swapping, it's going to block and wait for all those others. And this was a, like an 80 CPU box, so every single thread was stopping, waiting for another thread to continue. And what I found out later, the reason why they used our kernel in the first place, because they want a, rel, a Red Hat Enterprise system with the latest kernel, and the real-time kernel just happened to be newer than the one that RHEL had. <laughs> so they were trying to slip by, like, no, go back to RHEL. So, by the way, I know I have an Intel shirt on, but I don't represent Intel. It's just, I just like this shirt. Oh, is this thing on? <laughs> what is that? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yesterday I talked about this. You know, I talked about deterministic results. Um, uh, repeatable results, doing what you expect, when you expect it, and no unbounded latencies. Um, and calculate worst time scenarios. And, um, but here I want to say all environments must be in real time. Everything that you do in your system must be understand. So I've talked about real fast and real time. Paul McKenney gave a real talk about you know, real time versus real fast. Um, and certain things of the hardware, like you have, like cache. Uh, when you have a hot cache, things go faster. Uh, look, ahead, look ahead features. Um, when you're reading a file, and, uh, this is the old day when you had the uh, old spinning disks, not your SSDs and all that. But in the old, they actually had a lot of optimization that saying, hey, we can read ahead on a lot of the files because we know where the disk is spinning. And if you, a lot of times when you access a file, you access it sequentially. So the kernel would say, hey, keep looking ahead. And this actually optimized the read. So there's a lot of features like this. Um, we have paging. We, um, Least interruptions is what we want. But yeah, so basically a lot of times we want to prevent things from interrupting. And we like to optimize the most likely cases, you know, transactional memory. Anyone know about that? So there's a balance. Because just because you have a real-time system doesn't mean you want a slow system. So we really push everything to make it fast. We develop the kernel and see as make it as fast as we can without sacrificing determinism. And it's constantly, we're constantly improving our kernel to make it faster and faster and faster to make it almost equal to what vanilla Linux has. So inside the system, you know, we have the application on top. Uh, you have your library infrastructure. You have your kernel infrastructure. You have your BIOS um, from the machine or firmware, whatever you want to call it. And then you actually have the hardware. Every one of these things has to be real-time aware if you want a real-time system. Uh, as it shows, applications can skip through the libraries and even sometimes the kernel and direct, talk directly with the hardware. Uh, libraries can do the same, and uh, you have the kernel. So going with the hardware first, <clears throat> this is the foundation. So if the hardware isn't real time, your rest of the system will not be real time. Uh, this is the hardest thing to tell people. And I hate to say this, Intel is one of the most unpredictable um, <laughs> uh, platforms you could ever work on. And that's because Intel really tries hard to be fast. Everyone worries about benchmarks. Everyone worries about gigahertz. Everyone worries about this. And to do this, they got to do tricks. And these tricks usually um, are basically random, or they work really fast most of the time, but then you have the outliers. I told you, outliers are bad on a determ deterministic system. So you have memory cache. You know, all these things are horrible for real time. Uh, <laughs> memory cache, page protection, NUMA, hyperthreading, TLBs, transactional memory, SMIs, and CPU frequency scaling. So, memory cache. Ah, so, this is one thing. I was trying to make a deterministic system, and memory cache is one of the things that's really, really hard to find out what's your worst case scenario because you really never know what's actually happening. You could check for cache misses, but you really don't know exactly how the application works. I used to tell people if you really want to know if you can make all your deadlines, disable cache. Uh, you'll be running like a Commodore 64 speed. But you'll know if you could do that, you're fine. But a lot of times, that's too much. Okay? If you disable spec cache, sometimes your system will, may take a day to boot. Uh, so try to run applications. Try to jump around a lot. You know, basically do everything you're told not to do in programming. Get rid of localized caching. 
You know, try to do things like tricks like this to basically constantly be hitting cold cash. Not, not like this is for the application, but do it in an experiment to try to see if you can still figure out what is your worst case scenario. Because real time is all about worst case scenarios. So you try to make things really, really bad to see if this could still fit within the time frame that I require. Because there might be some case that this might actually happen where the cash gets flushed or something and you hit something that all your test cases made it within a few microseconds, suddenly it's uh, almost a millisecond. And that's because everything was bad cash. So a lot of times I tell people for test cases, try to run on a really bad cash system. And here's, the, oh yeah, this is one thing. Uh, if your system works without cash, it should work with cash. It was funny because one might say, well, I think I said is except for race conditions. <laughs> you just can't win. Uh, there's been times where um, uh, if you have really good cash, um, your system, well, if you run slow cash, yes, everything works, but when you speed it up, um, you could trigger a race condition that might actually cause a problem later on. So just because it works without the cash doesn't mean it will work with cash. Because when you change time, means race conditions become lovely. Okay, this is a screenshot of my little tool called Kernel Shark. Um, it reads off of a uh, function, or F trace. Uh, you run trace command, it records a file, and I just recorded the sketch switch, uh, sketch switch uh, time frames, and then I was able to filter off this application. I was writing a tool for sched deadline. Uh, I won't talk about sched deadline, that's a whole talk that I'll be talking at uh, Embedded Linux conference in two weeks in Berlin. So if you guys go to Berlin two weeks for Embedded Linux conference, I'll be talking about sched deadline there. Uh, but I was writing a tool running sched deadline, which is a periodic uh, thing, and I was trying to see how um, What's it called? Um, uh, I was trying to get the test the quality of it. So I need to write um, an application that could run something for an amount of time. And that would be almost pretty much consistently be that amount of time. So I started calculating prime numbers. Say, hey, that's a good application to try. Just so I had a tool that just calculated prime numbers up. And I did so many. And I said, I figure out, okay, if I want to calculate you know, you know, 10,000 primes, then it will take this long, and I would, could say, here's my runtime that I need, and I has to, and to determine whether or not within that period it made those 10,000 primes. I'm like, okay, this is good to go. And but when I run the application, it would make it, then it would make, not, then fail. It would make it, then it would fail, and make it, then it would fail. And I was looking at this thing because I had, I used more than one thread, so there's uh, multiple threads doing this, working on these prime, the prime number, and then I, I was like, I'm an idiot. Talk about cache problems. <laughs> I um, Used the multiple threads were actually calculating the same value, or I mean, I had one va global variable, and I was trying to see how high I could get in the primes. So I had all the threads working on that same variable, and you can see here how when they were running together, it took a lot longer to finish, and when they're running, you know, by themselves, they're very short. You see that on the side. So whenever the two were running together, whoops, whoops wrong way. Whenever the two were running together, it extended, and then it was short, 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 extend, short, 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 extend. This is where they failed the deadlines. And I, then I'm like, well, duh, cash. You had a little bouncing back and forth. You know, the right, you're writing to two uh, threads on two different CPUs are writing to the same memory location. That's going to cause cash to choose. So right there, it's beautiful to see how much uh, the system slows down when you have two things writing to the same variable. That's why reader writer locks are horrible in the kernel, by the way. Because even though you have two readers that are writing together, they have to sync off of the same variable. Even though when you grab a lock, you, those things, that kills the cache big time. So it's just, it'll slow down the system if you have a lot of reader writer locks use, connecting together. So that's why we tell people in mainline, stop using reader writer locks. Because uh, it doesn't always help. Branch prediction. Um, people familiar with branch prediction? Intel has a lot of great branch prediction. What that basically means is as the CPU is going down, it's coming up to a branch. When it takes, it takes a, 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 a variable and compares, it says, okay, we're going to jump here or jump there. And if you're always jumping to one location, the CPU memorizes that. Because for loading in the pipeline, as it's coming down, it sees that branch coming up and it's going to assume, okay, we're going to jump to this location. So it starts reading the cache and the memory from that location. So when it gets there, it's, it jumps. So if... You're, this speeds up the system because what happens when the branch, the branch prediction is wrong? 
Now it hits, it causes a stall, the CPU stops, it's got to fetch memory from a different location, and then everything goes that way. So failed branch predictions can cause a pretty big impact. Um, I was running my, this test again, and I found out that it would work sometimes, and then it wouldn't work sometimes. It would fail. It took a long time, and everything was horrible. Um, and I found out I ran perf stat on my uh, deadline tool, and I recorded when it did well, which was here. You see branch misses. The one thing that was different was branch misses. That's what it was. And right here, it's 798,000 branch misses. Um, when it was bad, I had 4 million branch misses. And I was like, what the hell is going on here? Why is branch prediction so horrible? And darn it, I should have, I know I didn't put it up here. I should have cut and pasted in there. Um, LW, in fact, I should do that. I should have it up. Hold on. Just because I, hey, I can do this. Yes? Um, <laughs> Wait, what was that? Say, say it again. Zero. No. I, I didn't really actually take, I've never done a test on exactly what. Um, LW, I, my code, I was just talking about this yesterday, that my code um, made quote of the week of LWN. And it was this, define if. Uh, what define if, I wrote this little tracing tool to be able to um, record statistics of every single branch that was going on. Well, what happened was when I was doing this test, I had this enabled. <laughs> so I was actually, uh, this kills branch prediction. Um, and it kills GCC's warnings. It, tell, it keeps telling you this code may not be, you know, this variable may be uninitialized because it adds so many conditionals within the kernel. And that's why sometimes it got lucky that branch prediction was okay. And then when I had, um, <clears throat> uh, what's it called? Uh, then it, this, the go into the kernel a lot, this would kill branch prediction. So every branch prediction was wrong or just flush it out. And um, that was the reason why that I had such a huge difference. When I went in and turned this off, all that issue went away. <laughs> this is very nasty. Oops. Darn it. I hit the wrong one. Yeah. There. Numa. Um, this is where you have different memory uh, for large scale boxes. Um, How's the acronym go? Non, um, yeah. what was it? Non-uniform memory access, right? Okay. I, would, I couldn't remember the exact terminology. I didn't want to be wrong. Um, so basically, we deal, especially Red Hat Enterprise Linux, deals with lots of large boxes, and we're dealing with financial firms that are using these boxes, and we're using the real-time patch. And one thing we have is that... Um, a lot of them you have like, you know, said if you have 80, 80 CPUs, a lot of times it'll be like four nodes. And, uh, you know, group of CPUs, uh, so you have, yeah, you have like 20 CPUs using one set of memory and 20 CPUs using another set of memory and back and forth. And if you ever have a case where you're um, accessing memory on a different node, it's going to slow things down. And it changes, it's non-deterministic. So if half the time you're on your own node and suddenly you're accessing something on another node, your times are all just changed. And that could really cause a lot of issues. Uh, so I always say, make sure the RT tasks are on a single node. And a lot of times you want any application on different nodes, and you don't want them sharing any resource at all. Uh, one of the tools that we use to test uh, machines and verify machines is something called RT eval. It was mentioned in another talk, too. And uh, uh, what it does is basically it runs Hackbench. It runs um, yeah, Hackbench, uh, Cyclic Test, and uh, Kernel Compiles. And one thing we found out that some of these larger machines were failing the ver verification. And when I looked into it, I did the tracing of it, I said, well, you know, when we get to these large uh, machines, we're going to have to change our requirements on how to be able to succeed. One of the requirements is 
everything, you can't have applications with a lot of processes sharing resources across nodes. And what happened was we had um, our tests, we kicked off cyclic tests on every single CPU. So every single CPU was being tested. And then we kicked off Hackbench across all CPUs and the kernel compile across all CPUs. Now Hackbench will bounce around and it shares like semaphores and such within the kernel. And when they share stuff with, or, and some of these semaphores have internal spin locks, and when these spin locks are being shared across 80 CPUs are being shared across NUMA nodes, I was finding that we were to grab a spin lock was, caught, was taking three to 400 microseconds to grab a spin lock, a real spin lock to spin. And to do that, interrupts are disabled, preemption is disabled, so if a uh, real-time task needed to wake up on that CPU while that spin lock was trying to be grabbed for 400 microseconds, it would take 400 microseconds for that uh, task to go. And we, our limit is 150 microseconds for a response time. So that obviously would kill us. So our requirement, what we found out is if we actually took all the hack benches, we had all CPUs running hack bench, but we ran off, like say if you had four NUMA nodes, and we ran uh, our, the the, uh, what's called the loads, the hack bench and kernel compiles, and we boxed it up per node. So we ran it, we ran four instances of the load, but we, as long as we compartmentalize them on each node, we passed again. Because the, having the cross node interactions caused the non real time tasks to uh, block in real critical sections, causing issues with the real time tasks when the, the event went off and needed to run. Hyper threading. Yes? The cube. Uh, what do you mean by more particular? Uh, uh, and we don't add anything to to make sure that uh, you know. Um, all this code's upline, uh, mainline. So basically, the RT patch and the, the vanilla kernel have the same thing. And um, we're telling you, this is all user space defined. User space needs to be careful about how their tasks migrate. You've got to put the affinity in. You, and I'll be talking about that a little bit later, too. Um, which is also reminded me, yesterday I talked about Jack, and I looked up the code, and it says, today you don't need to run a real-time kernel using Jack. And I talked to uh, uh, some of the musicians that use the code, and they said, thank you, real-time people, because you've added so much to Vanilla Kernel that the Vanilla Kernel can, most of the cases, be good enough for recording today than it used to be. And it was only, it was because, they acknowledged it was because of all the updates that the real-time kernel has done to uh, Mainline. Okay, so hyper-threading. Um, <clears throat> So you have the, it's in the Intel processor, although I hear AMD has a similar thing. I know it's Intel. Uh, you have one execution unit, uh, one system bus, one cache. You have two sets of registers, and this is where we're kind of like I said, two sets of CPU pipelines, but technically it's one set, but in logical, I'll say logical pipelines. Um, and you have basically an ex um, uh, execution engine that switches between them on stalls. To try, basically, because when a CPU is running and it needs to fetch something, it's a stall there. So this is the idea that you know, the Intel engineer said, well, while we're stalled, maybe we could do something else. So if we could create maybe another thread to be, so as you're working, when one stalls, we'll have the other one working, um, do the work as well. So the CPU is doing more work while it's waiting for memory fetches and such. So here's a little kind of diagram of what kind of like uh, this looks like. You have... Um, kind of two logical uh, pipelines, two full sets complete registers, but one engine right in the middle that switches back and forth and it works. So talk about deterministic, I don't think I have to really explain that this isn't deterministic. Um, the first thing we tell people on any real-time system is disable hyperthreading. It's going to cause unpredictable results. Uh, and sure enough, you can't guess if you have the CPU and you talk about nosy, na uh, noisy neighbor issues. This is a huge, no, nosy, noisy neighbor issue. If you have a non-real-time task running on one thread and a real-time task running on the other thread, that's going to cause a, uh, a lot of issues. Um, although I will say Intel has a new quality of, serv or quality of service um, uh, caching where you can actually uh, partition the cache and give it to specific tasks. 
That's going to help. That's actually a plus for Intel for making their systems better, more, better for real time. Uh, translate, uh, translation look aside buffers. So, for those that don't know about how page tables work, although I think this group does you know, have an idea of how your page tables work, you know, when you get a virtual address, you've got to map it to some physical address somewhere. Either it's going to be memory or maybe a data I.O. And so to do this, um, so every application can have the same uh, virtual address and not be crashing over each other because the memory is actually going to be elsewhere stored. You break up your address space. So you go to read some address and you take the first few bits and it's going to look up the page in the page table and take the next bits to find the location for the next page table. And the next few bits will find the next page table. And, and whether you have two level, three level, four level, eventually you get to the actual real memory pages. And that could take some time. So what the, uh, the computer does, or the CPU does, as most people know, is usually something like a translational look aside buffer that basically is a cache for the page tables. So when you go to look at it, it will hit that cache, the page table, and jump right to it. This is great. It speeds things up tremendously. But then again, if you have a TLB miss, boom. Your system slows down. The number of TLB misses you have, the more, the slower your um, uh, <clears throat> your um, tool or your process will be. So I tell people, you know, try maybe throwing things to flush a TLB all the time if you will, if you're looking for the worst case scenario. Doing something to inject TLB misses. Uh, that way you're slowing. You're doing everything wrong. You're slowing the system down, but you're always looking for that worst case scenario to know that what your deterministic time could be that you could require. Um, to make sure you can make your deadlines. <clears throat> Transactional memory. Now, this is like when we saw this, we all, like all the real time fo folks, gave out this great, <sighs> like, oh, shit, not another freaking thing. Thank you, Intel. Um, from, although, thankfully, uh, thankfully so far, actually, we, were, we, we cheered this, but I guess uh, there were some issues that this doesn't actually work well, so they disabled it. That was the last I heard. <laughs> so uh, we're like, what? Is it enabled now? Um, I guess the idea is the fact that, you know, you can actually, um, instead of grabbing a lock, you could just say, well, we're going to work on cr uh, critical section areas. And the CPU and hardware will know if something else accesses that same area. And if it does, it will roll back to where you started to continue. So if you have small, like, little sections, like, say, if you have to update a couple of variables, I guess it's possible to say, hey, Put this in a special transactional memory. Don't grab a lock. Just go through it. And if, a, if another CPU were to touch that, it would back out everything you did. And then you'd actually grab the lock and go the slow path. Great. Most of the time, there's not contention. Most of the time, this is going to be really, really fast. But you just added another case where you can't determine if this is the worst case scenario. And it just it extends it. So when you can't determine if you can really make your deadlines, that's bad. We want to know what is the worst case scenario. That's the only thing. No outliers. We keep saying we don't want an outlier. This is something that's going to cause another outlier. System monster interrupt. <laughs> oh, we love these. Um, and I won't name the vendor. I don't want someone else saying it. Um, <clears throat> that's you, Boris. <laughs> Because I know exactly, you know who I'm talking about. Um, there's so many times that we go to verify a box and we're getting 400 microsecond latent uh, jitter. Um, and I go to look at it and I said, something's wrong. Because this 400 microsecond jitter happens periodically, every 14 minutes. Every 14 minutes, a 14, uh, like this 400 microsecond jitter happens. Every four, uh, 14 minutes. I'm like, this is not the kernel. Something is going on. And we talk to the vendor and they say, no, I'm like, do you have SMIs running? And they say, no, we don't. And I'm like, yes, you do. And we created this tool called a, a hardware latency detector. And in 4.9, it's going to be a tracer. So 4.9, we got it in. Uh, well, it's not, well, I don't know if it's in yet. I haven't pushed it. Because <laughs> Lena said, I don't want this. <laughs> so if he lets it in, um, this latency tracer is basically a simple thing, and I have to work on the t t uh, TSC ABS, and we talked about clocks. Uh, it does a little spin. It disables interrupts and does a little spin on the t t uh, uh, timestamp counter. And um, it reads A, reads B, calculates the difference, goes back around, and then on the next round, it calculates the previous last uh, timestamp with the first one now, and it records when... Uh, What's the biggest difference? And then you put a threshold. And we usually make a threshold, okay, 10 microseconds. We'll say 10 microseconds is okay. 
But anything, if for some reason reading a TSC under, with interrupts disabled jumps more than 10 microseconds, something else is at a mist. And I ran this thing on, and it, the one that's in the kernel that's going, or that's going to be up in uh, 4.9, it runs as a single thread, and it bounces from C every time it does, a, um, it does it for a period, and you could determine how long it runs for. So you can say for, you know, uh, half a second, or I want you to run, you know, maybe 500, um, well, actually, maybe something like 500 microseconds every uh, millisecond. So 50% of the time, it's hogging the CPU. Uh, and, um, and then it bounces to the next CPU, next CPU, and then you could change which CPU it runs on. And if it detects something, it write, writes to the F-trace buffer, and you can see any jumps. Well, when we ran this on this box, every 14 minutes, this thing showed a um, 400 microsecond latency. And I said, okay, right there, that's not the kernel. Interrupts are off. There's no NMIs happening. This is you. And when they came back, they, they searched and said, oh, yeah, we have um, uh, the ECC memory thing going off, checking memory corruption. Uh, so it's doing a memory scan of the entire CPU every 14 minutes. <laughs> so, yeah, that was uh, uh, fun. Now, although fast is one of the enemies of real time, so is power management. Um, one of the things we had really big time with CPU polling, and someone mentioned before, if your CPU is not doing anything, it should go into a sleep state. And for those that know power management, especially embedded folks, the deeper the sleep, the better the power management. And unfortunately, as everyone else knows, the deeper the sleep, the longer it could take. It could take milliseconds for a CPU to get back up to full power again. Well, <laughs> that's not going to help you very much on a real-time system. In fact, there's been some real-time systems we tell people idle equals pole, which means that it doesn't ever sleep. It just spins, waiting for interrupts. And I tell people when you do this, you have to, you know, the earth will get warmer, and your AC bill is going to get a lot higher. Um, so it's not, the real time is not environmentally friendly. Uh, so the kernel. I talked about some of these things. We have uh, thread interrupts, which I talked about. System management threads, high resolution timers, CPU um, isolation, no hertz and no hertz full. Um, I talked about interrupts yesterday, about the normal interrupt and how we make it into a thread. Um, So, but here's the interesting thing. I said yesterday that I'm going to talk today about interrupt threads and how it could become an issue for you. Uh, when you have interrupts as threads, it's basically, I would say, real time is the gun to shoot yourself in the foot with. You can destroy the system. Uh, you can, if, your system or if you have a task that's a higher priority than an interrupt thread, and this interrupt thread needs to run to continue the system, the system will crash. Like I said, you need to know the system. It's up to you to um, prevent... Catastrophe. So one thing I've had people do, and I think I have the example in here, uh, one guy said, geez, uh, I'm, the system locks up when I run your tool. And I found out what they were doing was they were waiting on a network task, pulling for a network to come in, and the network interrupt happened to be lower priority than the task that was pulling, and it was on the same CPU. So what happened was, because they were both bound, so the one guy's waiting for this, you know, doing a bunch of work, waiting for the network interrupt to come in, but it was preventing the network interrupt from running because it was running at a higher priority. I'm like, that's kind of stupid. So you really have to look at what, you have to know what interrupts your uh, process needs and make sure that those, pro those interrupts are a higher priority than your process and everything else should be lower priority than your process. So this is up to you to know what your process is doing and what hardware it's using and um, how to uh, manage that. Soft interrupts, soft IRQ. Now, how many people are like working the kernel at all? Not many? Okay. Um, <clears throat> soft interrupts was always a pain for us, and I think we got a good solution now. Thomas Gleichner came up with something. It took a lot, long time to work with it, and I think it's rather clever. And uh, soft interrupts have a long history in the system, and there's, and there's only a few soft interrupts. You can't add any more. Um, <laughs> some of the soft interrupts, like... Um, we have networking, soft interrupts, uh, I.O., block I.O., um, RCU, timer, uh, handler. So when a soft interrupt really comes in, is it's, it runs in a, it's at a higher context than pro 
process in a process context. Like so, whenever you do a system call and you're into the kernel, you're in what's called process context. So basically, you could sleep, you could schedule, you could preempt it. Soft IRQ context. When it, a soft IRQ kicks off, it will preempt a um, uh, what's called a process context, and it runs and it can't be preempted. It has to finish before it can be preempted. But if an interrupt happens while the soft IRQ is going on, the soft IRQ will be preempted by the interrupt, and the interrupt will run. Now that's in vanilla Linux, not the real-time Linux, and not with real-time Linux with threads. So when you have threaded interrupts, what we have is we've, we change how soft IRQs work now. First of all, we had this before we used to, we made all the soft IRQs into threads. So we had a thread for networking interrupts, we had a thread for networking soft IRQ, we had a thread for um, uh, what's it called networking IO, block IO. But this was causing us problems because in um, vanilla Linux, you, a soft IRQ could run on any CPU. So we actually had a soft IRQ for every a thread for a soft IRQ for each soft IRQ for each CPU. So if you had 80 CPUs, we had 80 networking interrupt soft IRQ. And then actually the soft IRQ, there's a receive and a send. So it's not, we had two threads for networking. And for every, and that just didn't scale. And that was kind of a fuss. And we found issues where uh, performance was being killed by this. It was a lot of context switching and such. So what we did was we changed it. We said, if you raise the soft IRQ, you run the soft IRQ. Because what happens, what it means by raise the soft IRQ is if a uh, networking packet comes in, the interrupt handler will handle it, the networking interrupt will take it, and it's going to do so much work to, from the device. And once it can pass it off to all the uh, TCP IP layers, uh, that's done in soft IRQ context. So once it gets to a point where it has the packet from the hardware, it says, okay, let the rest of the, uh, of the uh, networking stack take it, and it raises a soft IRQ. And the soft IRQ will then take it and do the rest of the work. So today, that networking in a real-time patch kernel, that networking interrupt handler is a thread. So it can, pa it can be preempted. It has, it's a process context. So there, a thread and interrupt handler is in a process context. It's not in an interrupt handler context. So it can sleep and block and all that other fun stuff. So when you have a, a network interrupt that goes to run and it goes to do the soft IRQ, instead of waking up another thread and then you have to change the priorities of all that, when it releases the bottom half handler, so basically it re-enables soft IRQs, which means it's, it's finished its thread work and it's about to go to sleep again. At the time that it says, okay, soft IRQs are enabled again, it, our code will check, hey, you raised a soft IRQ while we you had the soft IRQs disabled. You run it at your priority. Yes? And it could still do. Whichever one that raised the soft IRQ. Yeah. I don't think it's much different. No, because it doesn't stop the networking. If there's another networking device that gets called, it will wake up and it will try to run it and it will say, oh, this soft IRQ is already being run or whatever and it will just go to sleep or whatever. I mean, it won't. And the other, the, if the soft IRQ is being run by the first networking device, it's going to handle all the network, anything that happens. So, Yeah, but that's true for uh, any soft IRQ. If, uh, right today, if one interrupt goes off and it wakes up the soft IRQ handler, and by the way, the soft IRQ goes in through, and today it's actually even worse because if it goes, if it does one handler and it says, after it calls the uh, networking soft IRQ and another packet came in, because this is Nappy, Nappy does this, uh, Nappy will say, hey, um, <clears throat> it could do a lot of processing, and if it comes out of it and it's gotta go back and, and do it again, the soft IRQ will say, well, we're, we're, remember, we're in interrupt context here. And the soft IRQ work will say, hey, we're, we're spending too much time in interrupt context. Kick off K soft IRQD and go run that. 
And now KSOFT RQD will go and do everything. And it's doing the work for everyone. And this is really kind of the same thing. If you need that, that would be something that you'd have to like customize. Uh, because right now, we could do that, but imagine the work that we'd have to do to make it different than mainline. Right now, we're trying to keep the paradigm between mainline and real time very, very similar. Uh, otherwise, the patch is going to grow again. And we, we really don't want to do that. We're trying to become one. Of, and then if we could get real time accepted into mainline, and this becomes an issue where people say, could we change this? Hopefully, someone writes a patch, submits it to mainline. That's a change that would have to be done in mainline after real time is accepted. So. Um, now, what happens though, because sometimes some hard interrupts stay hard in real time. Um, so, these are the RCU timers, um, and I think there's one other one, but the main one is RCU and timers. A hard interrupt goes off, because the timering is, there's, like I said before, the time, there's no timer thread interrupt handler. When a timer interrupt goes off, the work is done at, in the hard real con uh, context. And say if it raises a soft IRQ, well, it can't run the soft IRQ code because the soft IRQ code can sleep. So we can't do that from uh, real time. So we go back to the old way of it runs KSoft IRQD. Um, I don't know if I'd say it, but. Ah, actually, this has become an issue. Um, I don't know if I have it in my slides or not. So I'm going to say it anyway. So no. uh, I said the timers are running KSoft IRQD, but say KSoft IRQD also runs RCU stuff. And there's been times where uh, RCU is causing uh, timers to be problems, and you have a real-time task that requires a uh, response from the uh, case or the timer R uh, soft IRQ. So you have the timer soft IRQ up high. We don't want to make the case soft IRQD at a high priority because uh, we need that data because it's running RCU stuff, and RCU stuff can take a long time. So what we did was we actually made a K time soft IRQD, which does only the soft. We've separated out. Um, the timers, so the timers have their own threads. So basically, for the ones that are raised from soft IRQ or from the hard interrupt, we'll probably keep them as separate threads to have the control to say, hey, I need timers, the soft IRQ, the timer, to be at a high priority because my process is utilizing it, uh, but I don't want to be burdened by RCU work. So we've separated that today. Um, so our system management threads, uh, there's a lot of times where uh, we call into the kernel that it's going to kick off some work. And here's one of the times when you do a real-time system, you really want to know what your, uh, uh, your system is going to make its deadlines and it's going to work. When you, you have to look at every single system call you make. You have to um, audit it and see what um, threads are going to be woken up or used. So you, if it does something where it does like um, a K-worker thread, you got to look at what K worker thread is because that's going to be a thread. You got to make sure that has the priority to make sure it doesn't get preempted. And then you have inverse pri um, priority inversion because your high priority task is way on K, uh, K worker thread that's a low priority task. And there's something in the middle that's ca causing a lot of issues. Uh, the migrate working, th by the way, if you see a migrate thread, that runs at the highest level uh, processing because the migrate thread is what causes every one, or pulls tasks from one CPU to another CPU. And it's also what will shut down the machine on stop machine. That's a, or what we call, or what Thomas likes to call stomp machine. Because it kills uh, the, the system. So timers. Uh, I mentioned timers. These are the timers that actually use the HR timers. Uh, so make sure you use these timers, uh, but you have to be aware of them. Uh, set I timer will, um, when it goes off, it's going to send a signal to you. And since it goes off in hard interrupt context, it will wake up. This is one of the things that actually I say KSoft RQD requires. This is incorrect. I didn't update my slide since I wrote this because we've changed the code. There's now the K time soft RQD, so that's actually wrong. Uh, so when the set I timer goes off, it will uh, the timer interrupt will wake up the KSoft IRQD thread to handle all the wake-ups for those that um, need the signal. And then that thread is going to start sending signals to your process. And signal handling is a huge mess. Uh, and it's a, basically a byproduct from uh, Unix days of IPC communications. And signals are horrible. And the code in the, in the kernel is horrible just because it has so many requirements that are just so horrible. Uh, 
kind of like USB. Uh, <laughs> that, you know, if the requirements are horrible, the codes will be horrible. So um, signals are horrible, and they, they're, they will give you probably a few hundred uh, microseconds to get a response time from. So, but using K timer, uh, timer, K, uh, timer create and timer set time, that actually will, the hard interrupt will wake you up. So if you need a signal from that, it's just going to, if you block on it and you say, I need to wake up, woken up at a certain time, this will actually wake you up. So you don't have to worry about it. But that's not a signal time. Um, Well, maybe it does use a signal again. Yeah, I think it does use it. So, yeah, signals are horrible. Um, I guess nano sleep is what you want to do. Nano sleep is where you want to wake up directly. Iso uh, CPU isolation. Here's another thing that you could use for if you want to make try to get some really good performance. If you can make a CPU work for your real time tasks and get everything else off of it, that helps with um, getting rid of uh, unpre unpredictable um, instances. So. The kernel parameter that you use is ISO CPUs, you know, one through three. That's so CPU one through three. So CPU zero is fine, but this means you have uh, that would be at least four CPUs. Um, <clears throat> although we no longer, perf this is talking to different kernel developers. Some people say don't use this anymore; they hate it. Like Peter Zilstra doesn't care for this, uh, but it's still kind of the recommended way of doing it by Red Hat. Uh, so we're we're you'll know, hear a conflicting suggestions on how to do this. Uh, <laughs> so ISO CPUs, I mean, it still works. It basically keeps those CPUs from running anything else if you have to actually push something on that CPU. Uh, you will see the system management threads uh, will still run on those CPUs because system management threads uh, that are for the Linux kernel, run on, there's ones that run on every single CPU, regardless of whether it's isolated or not. Uh, but once you boot up, if you didn't do this in the kernel command line primer, uh, CPU sets is a way to use it. Um, here's a, some way to basically how you can make that. And you gotta move, once you make the CPU set, if there's anything running on it, it still runs on it, you actually have to go look at all the tasks that are on that CPU or that you just isolated and move them off of the uh, CPU. And then they won't go back onto it. Uh, that helps a lot. No hertz. Now this is just a normal no hertz. This has been in the kernel for a while. I'm sure John could tell you exactly when. Um, <clears throat> this is, again, where you have problems with uh, power management. This is great for power management. Well, CPU no hertz, when you, config, when you enable this config, uh, when your CPU goes idle, where there's nothing running, it's going to turn off the clock. And because without CPU config no hertz, uh, and say if you have a 100 hertz, uh, config 100 hertz um, uh, timer, uh, and when you built their own kernel, you'll see there's 100 hertz, 250, 1,000 hertz. Uh, what that means is that there's a, there's a periodic timer interrupt that's going to go off all the time at that frequency. And this is because in the old day, we had this thing called a jiffy, and that was the timing that you had. That was, a, that was a precision of your timer before HR timers came around. And this, that interrupt is still today. And every second, and it's used for scheduling, and it's used to calculate your, you know, the usage times. Ever use the command time, time run application? It'll tell you how long you're in the system, how long you're in the user. This is determined by the uh, clock tick that goes on and on and on. And what happens is if you have a 100 hertz uh, configuration and you go to sleep, that means 100 times a second, your CPU is being woken out of sleep to say, hey, um, handle this timer up. There's nothing to do. Go back to sleep. And then it goes back to sleep and wakes up again. Hey, there's nothing to do, go back to sleep. Well, config no hertz says, hey, we're going to sleep. There's nothing to do anymore for the timer. Shut it off. So now while you're in idle mode, that CPU will not do anything. So if there's nothing running on that CPU. It's going to go into a real deep sleep. Again, I told you that's great for power savings, but it sucks for um, real time. So a lot of times we tell people get turn off config no hertz on a real-time kernel, because although it's great for your power management, it's that's you will see if you run cyclic tests and run that on that and without a load. This is where you sometimes this is weird because sometimes we run cyclic tests and with a load it does it works, and then we take off the load, run cyclic tests, it fails constantly, and that was because we had config no hertz on, and what happened was the CPU went into a deep sleep, and then when cyclic tests went to go off, it took a long time to wake that up again and run. So cyclic tests did well with a load, but as soon as we went to idle machine. It was failing its uh, deadlines. 
Here's something that's actually good for um, real time. Config no hertz full. This is a, a project that's still ongoing. Uh, we still, it's not totally there yet. Uh, what we have is instead of, right now if there's a single process running, because the timer tick is used for a few things, and one of the things it's used for is scheduling. So if you have one task that's onto a CPU, and it's basically not doing system calls, so it's not calling to the kernel, it's gonna wake up you know, kernel tasks, and it's just doing maybe, maybe it memory mapped the networking layer, and you're just pulling on the networking layer, or from a networking device. Um, this works, uh, that, that's a, one of the fast ways to work, to, to get things done to, uh, fast. <clears throat> But what happens is you don't want to be preempted. You don't want to be preempted by an interrupt. Uh, that's going to cause a latency in your system because the timer interrupt could take maybe 10 microseconds. And maybe you, your system is pulling on something that 10 microseconds is, or sorry, not 10 micro, yeah, 10 microseconds is still too long because you're fighting nanoseconds. You're doing high frequency trade. You want to be able to get that trade in immediately. So you're spinning and as soon as you get the market, boom, you shoot it out. And this is a nanosecond race. This isn't even a, this is not a microsecond. So having an interrupt come in when that trade came in could cause a problem. So we want to turn off all interrupts if we just have a single process that's just doing a spin with the air, a condition, uh, air conditioner on real high and the earth warming up, but your stock market going up. Um, this is uh, uh, one of the things that we want to work. Unfortunately, right now, there's some uh, still accounting, and part of the accounting is your user, that user time still needs to be accounted. And what we have is when you, um, we have a one second tick. We got it down to one second. So every second the timer goes off just to do a little accounting and goes back to sleep. But there's some work to do. Uh, there's work to get rid of that one second tick. And I don't know, we're almost there. I hear, I see some patches that got, have done that. Um, so it's really um, ambitious to do this. We, but be careful, if you call into the system, if you do a system call, you could call threads or you could call, uh, if you use RCU, RCU may have to do some work. So if you're doing system calls, that's going to may, that may break your no hertz. So even though you're the only one running, if you're doing system calls, the kernel's going to need some timing interrupts to do some work. So after you get out of the kernel, we've got the library and the application layer. And when you have an RT task, there's certain things you've got to look at to make sure you do things right. First is memory locking. Um, when I first ran my first test, I was getting horrible uh, determinism, and I was like, what's going on here? I'm like, oh, shoot, I forgot, mlock all. Uh, because if, what mlock all does, uh, it's a system call that's going to basically look at what, look at your, uh, the file that's been loaded, and it's going to pull it into memory right away. Because right now, um, when you run uh, your Mozilla Firefox, and it can't load the whole thing into memory because it will crash. You know, eventually it does, and then you've got to reboot your machine because it's just, or you turn off Firefox and restart it because the memory is just so full. Um, sorry, Mozilla. The, um, <clears throat> what MLOC all does, does pulls everything in because otherwise you'll be pulling in page by page when you use it. So when you start off uh, your application, what the kernel will do is just says, okay, it, there, it puts up, um, it writes up some, um, descriptors that describe what memory your process uses, but it doesn't do anything else. So when you go to access, as soon as you go to run your application, the first thing it does, it tries to read some memory that doesn't exist and takes a page fault. And then what happens, it goes into the kernel, the page fault handler says, hey, this is a user space page fault, what happened? Well, it looks at its, at your VMA area and says, oh, yeah, this, this memory maps to this file on disk, go pull it in. So then it goes and it loads that page into memory, and then you go run, and then once you get off that page again, boom, you hit another page fault. Load that page into memory. So this is constantly going, and you're hitting all these page faults, and that is quite expensive work to do. So <clears throat> that's why I said, when I first ran it, I didn't do mlock all, and I was just getting you know, huge problems because I was hitting these page faults that were going on. mlock all will tell the kernel, I want the memory in. I, want, I don't want page faults. Take the stuff, take all my applications, and, any, and give me some heap as well, and load that into memory, so it's there when I go to access it, it it's um, available. Yes, block, block. Cube. Oh, wait, wait. So as a real-time developer, what is your opinion of the uh, Google Linux and especially the Google Linux? 
Turn it off. <laughs> yes. Wrong hand. Yeah, don't overcommit. Uh, hmm? Oh, I'm waiting for the answer here. Um, two things. One thing is um, LTP is not real-time aware. And I would say don't run LTP on a real-time system. No, no, it wasn't. No, 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 no. I'm saying, what I'm saying is right there is yes, LTP would fail. It's fine because there's things that, <clears throat> there's things that if you want a real-time go, you've got to have limits on what your system can do. So those things that will fail are probably things you can't do with that. You can enable overcommit. You just got to make sure your real-time applications aren't using it. So yes, we have overcommit enabled on our tests, but we make sure we, we actually make sure the RT tasks aren't using the overcommits. But ideally, if it's the more critical your system is, the more you would want to lock down on things like that. <clears throat> so yeah, here's the MLock all I've talked about. Uh, Priority, uh, priority inheritance, I already talked about that. Here's the, uh, the mutex I mentioned yesterday about the PI. Uh, so you make your separate protocol and you enable this uh, attribute, uh, pfed prio inheritant, uh, inherit. And if you remember what I also said yesterday, I love this slide. It's in all my threads. I've, I've already talked about this. And my, um, actually, here's a good thing. Where's the cube? Of course. <laughs> Question. Okay, did you guys not know that this is quiz time? <laughs> What's the problem here? <laughs> okay, Hawk, all right, process A, B, and C. A is highest, B is second, C is lowest. For what? Yeah. Well, yes, sort. Okay, who wants to answer the next question? I feel like Paul McKenney and his quizzes. Okay, I'll give you the next question and I'll throw it to you. How is this solved? Wait. Cue the C thread? <laughs> well, kill the C thread. Yeah, if you're a Mars lander, yeah, that would be the answer. I actually should ask that question. What, what product was it? Does anyone remember what the answer was here? Priority inheritance, yes. You win a prize. <laughs> you win a really nice uh, Kernel Recipes uh, hoodie. <laughs> Priority inheritance, remember? When C inherits uh, the priority of A, it runs. Okay, now this is what I kind of mentioned before about the dependencies between kernel threads and uh, your process. And you gotta, like I said, you have to look at every single thread that your system's using. You have to look at interrupts um, as well as um, uh, the CPU POSIX timer thread. That's another one that is another thread that uses the CPU POSIX timers. So you have the K timer D. I think that's the set I timer uses K timer T. The POSIX um, system, the timer threads uses the CPU POSIX timer. So if I go back there, if I believe correctly, and, and this is how this is how complex it gets because I even forget what it is. And usually what happens, I do is I go look at the uh, the kernel code to remember how. <laughs> remember what's going on. So if I'm at helping someone, if I'm at a contractor, I say, hey, this person needs help on their real-time tasks, I sometimes jump into the kernel because I don't really remember everything that has to be done. But I love open source. 
Yeah, so I believe the set eye timer is just a signal that goes off. I believe the timer create and timer set eye timer will use the CPU POSIX timer. So knowing which thread goes off, I may have to look at the code to make sure this is true um, on that. Because things change when I, uh, when I take off. Real time versus multiprocessors. Ah, yes. So if your real time tasks bounce around CPUs a lot, you're going, that's actually a great way to kill the cache. If you want to see how your cache is or how your process runs, have your uh, CPU process jump from CPU to CPU, and ideally jump from CPU node to CPU node. Or, so, or, yeah, so you go from, if you're a NUMA box, have an RT task jumping from node to node and see how well your system does. And if it can still make your deadlines, it's pretty good you're doing well. If it doesn't, it doesn't mean your system will fail. It just says you have to be aware that you're depending on cache. But this is where, this gives you an idea of knowing what you need um, <clears throat> from your system. And depending on cache is not a wrong thing, it's not a bad thing to do. Because there are times that, I believe I've seen some papers uh, out there that they um, are analyzing how, what's the minimum amount of cache that you would use on a normal system. They're actually looking for the worst case scenario. And if you have cache enabled, you'll never be as bad as cache disabled. And uh, so there is, a, there is a middle ground there. So just because you're dying on CPU cache doesn't mean that your system's going to fail when you run it in, uh, put it in production and run on a critical system. It just that means that you have to be aware that you're depending on cache to make sure this works. And you've got to make sure that you write your code knowing that it's, ca it's cache aware. I love this in CPU scheduling. And one of the issues that you have to be careful about. Um, so you have sched FIFO. When you, right now you have sched FIFO which is first in, first out, when you run at a priority, and it will just, your, your task is just going to run until it's done running, or a higher priority task stops it. Um, there's, a, there's a system called, called SCED Yield, and there's only one use case for that. If your application uses SCED Yield, I can almost guarantee you it's buggy. Um, it was used, we had a SCED Yield inside the Linux kernel, and every instance of it was buggy. In fact, it was so buggy that the Thomas and Ingo and Peter and myself got rid of all of them. We went around, got rid of all the sched yields in the kernel, and we no longer even export it. It's a kind of a special fu function that's used for the user space system call only. The kernel can no longer use sched yield because every instance of it was a bug. Uh, some people think that sched yield is saying, okay, I'm, I'm running, I don't want to go to sleep, but if anyone else is running, I'll let them run instead. But sched yield doesn't work if you're a sched FIFO unless there's another task out there that's running at exactly the same priority as you. So that's what, sched, that's what sched yield is for. It's a way of doing voluntary uh, uh, scheduling, voluntary preemption, where you're running, yes? Oh, okay. Where you're running, actually, I think it's like my last slide. So you're running up, and then you have your voluntary uh, preemption, so you do sched yield, and you have another task that's uh, same priority, it will run next. Some people like to use sched RR. I don't like using sched RR because there's no requirement for what the interval is. What sched RR means is sched round robin, which means that if you have two tasks of the same priority, the schedule, a timer will go off and it will, it will run one for so long and then run another one for so long and go back and forth. But there's no requirement that says how long it will run one, um, one of those threads. It could run it for as long, like it could be run several milliseconds. So I never understood why people use sched RR. I would love to get rid of sched RR, but it's a POSIX, one of these POSIX things, and we'll never get rid of it. And here's another problem that you have. If you have three sched RR processes of the same priority, and, and their affinity is on two CPUs, this one is going to run 100% of the time, the other one will run, they'll run 50-50 back and forth, and maybe they won't bounce around. Uh, it, there's no load balancing for sched RR. So you can have one running, they say, wait a minute, you would expect them to run one third of the time. But no, one of them will be running, one, like two of them will be running half of the time on one CPU, and one of them will be running full time on the CPU. So sched RR is like, get rid of it. Sched deadline is coming up, I'll give you a talk about it in Berlin in a couple weeks. And questions? Should I ask the questions again?
there is a multiple real time variety. You could say there is a nice speed tuning, and even with my real time variety parameters, it's a little bit of a nice time frame process, and if I real time and if I last process, it's still usually I will know the real time process to do. So you can make the speed tuner to be efficient or um, I don't know if I didn't read that paper, and maybe it's talking about the sched other. I don't care about non real time tasks. <laughs> so, the scheduling of non real time tasks may be of an issue. Um, I will say, if you think that your system, if you have a bunch of tasks and you send them to a real time, you use the real time scheduler, it's made for determinism. It's going to start bouncing things around like crazy. Because I wrote the migration code for, this, for the real time scheduler. And uh, what I'm saying is, if you have, if you have something like this in a sched FIFO, um, the real time scheduler will then, if that guy, if, one, if CPU 2 goes idle, it will move that immediately. There's a push pull uh, algorithm that I wrote for the CPU scheduler that was going to pull things out. Remember, I said real time versus real fast? <clears throat> the worst thing you do for a process is to aggressively migrate it. It's going to kill caches, it'll kill TLBs, it'll kill everything. The, the migration thread tries to um, let things run longer and it waits a while before it starts load balancing. So there's a huge heuristic on how to load balance sked other tasks. Real time, we don't have that heuristic. We are very aggressive. When there's a load balance that can happen, we load balance immediately, which is horrible for scheduling there. Uh, you said something about 95% RT and not. There is something in there. If you look in your code, I'll just do it real quick here. And I'm actually talking here too. Let's see here. Everyone can see that? Um, let's see. Is, uh, proc sys kernel. <coughs> There's, you'll see a sked RT period that says a period of one second. This is, I believe, in microseconds. And then there's, um, Runtime. So that's uh, 950 microseconds. Can you see that or is it off the screen? So you'll see is, um, if you look at these files, that means that if a, a real-time task runs for more than uh, 950 microseconds within one second, it will stop it. It will throttle, and you'll see like a nasty thing called RT, uh, sked RT throttle in your kernel console. And um, that means that it throttle it. That's what was added because if you ever had, this is done when we, we did have SMP boxes very much, and if RT task went wild, your system was locked up, and you couldn't get out of it. This was to prevent that, and the, the idea was no RT task should run more than that. Uh, you could disable this. By that. Whoops. Except you need to be root. Oops. Ah. Forgot. So once you do that, you put negative one in there. Now if my system runs a RT task, nothing's stopping it. They won't, they won't throttle. So you can turn that off. And that's what, that's by the way, that's, this is one of the things we recommend people to do on their systems that are running real time systems. Because we've had people hit this before and saying, what the hell? I'm like, oh yeah, you gotta turn this off. Another little gotcha. Okay? Put up your mouth as well. That sounds very much like a vendor. And that's not that's something I work on. For the vendor stuff, I usually we have we tell the we tell the customers go to the vendor and turn off anything that we want we want to do in that. <laughs> Red Hat verifies uh, servers. We have vendor. We go to the vendors and we will take their uh, machines and we'll verify it. And we work with them to set up the BIOS settings. And once we get to say this is okay, this can handle 
um, a good, um, a real-time task can work on this and we'll show you what it could do, what it can and cannot do to the customers. So we have a list of uh, hardware that we will say this is good, but that's just real-time. Anyone else, I don't work on that. Or just give me this. Throw it. Throw it. It's more fun to throw it. I can throw this too. Um, it, for, so wait, you're just saying the CPU masks isn't of what? The threads or the? Yes. Well, the CPU masks of other threads, they'll still, even if they include that uh, CPU, they'll never schedule on it. So is it a problem with the, the mask says it through there or just the fact that everything, once you move it off, it'll never come back on. I don't know what the CPU, I never look at the affinity. I didn't, I, I didn't look at the, what the affinity was and I could do that after, after this, I could actually run code and see it. Thank you very much.